If you are like me, I know that free enterprise is the greatest opportunity in the world, but you also see there are huge issues starting to arise, like why is mentorship decreasing in popularity? Why do entrepreneurs like us who love to succeed see people fail at the top and never leave true significance? And how do people like us make a lasting impact on the world, and is it possible for enough entrepreneurial leaders together to make a real difference? These are the blaring questions, and this podcast is the answer. Journey with me, your host, Christian. Together, we will challenge the status quo and conquer our legacies. For tuning in to Journey with Christian D. Evans podcast. Today, guys, we have someone extremely honored to be able to have him on our, on our podcast to share his information, to share what he has to offer. Guys, he is an authority. He has incredible credibility in this business niche. Guys, he is someone that I would recommend definitely with anything that you have. You guys, reach out to Google and ch- uh, put in Dave Farrow. Incredible authority. Guys, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dave. How are you doing today, Dave? Oh, I'm doing wonderful, man. Thanks very much for having me on the show, Christian. Well, thank you again for obviously just being part of, uh, you know, um, sharing some of your knowledge and wisdom. And I kind of just want to dive into it, you know, uh, and honestly, I don't want to get into obviously your, your background because, you know, you, you're such an authority. You probably said it numerous times. Anybody can go check out like Dave Farrow, Google, you know, what you've been able to do. But I kind of want to just dive in like, kind of like, you know, how you were able to make that switch from, you know, memorization skills to then bringing that skill to obviously the business world and how that has been able to really been helpful for you. Yeah, sure, sure. So you mean mean transitioning from like a, a speaker expert to running my own agency uh, or just, uh, you know, taking the skill itself and actually monetizing it? Basically the skill itself, exactly. Right. Okay, so yeah, so this is actually what we, we focus on in Ferro Communications, my, my, uh, my marketing agency, um, because uh, yeah, yeah, it's very, very rare that somebody does this correctly, in my opinion. And I, I'm more, very transparent. I'll tell you all the secrets that I've learned, and, and hopefully you know, some people uh, want to hire us to do it for them. But uh, basically, uh, there's a tremendous number of people out there who are great experts at what they do. Uh, they're experts either because of their education um, or because of something amazing they've done in their life. Uh, sometimes they're experts because of tragedy. There's a number of people who, uh, you know, speak on the college circuit. They're friends of mine, for example, that are experts because they, uh, you know, they were addicts at one time and they recovered from that and overcame that. So, um, you know, generally speaking, you got to have the, uh, the the before and the after in order to be an expert in that category. Um, so, uh, you know, the question really is, then I had the same situation. I was diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia when I was a kid, and I uh, pursued memory techniques and mnemonics to try to figure my brain out. In the process, I developed a, a, a mnemonic system. At that time, it was just to help students uh, study better, but it quickly became a tool that salespeople could use to remember people's names and things like that. Um, and to be honest, in the beginning, monetization, I didn't do it perfectly. Uh, I made mistakes like everybody else. Uh, the first thing I went after was uh, a Guinness record to really try to get that credibility. And I, I broke uh, the Guinness record. Now I'm two time Guinness record holder. But you know what, that didn't make me a dime. That's the thing people don't realize. Mm-hmm. There are actually world record holders. There are Olympic gold medalists yeah. that have had to pawn their gold medals because they don't make money afterwards and and it's a, it's a horrible tragedy when you reach that that pinnacle you just expect the sky to open up and money to fall out and it doesn't it just doesn't um what you have to do is exchange a, a service this is kind of you know basic economics 101 uh but you have to offer I, I would say the best thing to do with your expertise is to find the people that need that expertise the most and go after it in my case i tried everything for a while and then i just doubled down on what worked to be honest and sometimes that is a, a very valid strategy. So I tried to teach, you know, other students how to study better, had some great successes, but they weren't financial successes because students have no money, right? So if I was going to continue this and do this for a living and, and, you know, eat more than ramen noodles, I had to, uh, you know, appeal to, to other, other demographics. Even though I was a, I was a young kid, uh, very quickly people who are uh, 45, 50 plus were interested in memory techniques because they were worried about their memory. So I started asking myself, how can I serve this market? How can I reach this market? One of 
one of the best things that I did in the beginning was to offer myself as a speaker for free and sell products. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a way to get in the door. Uh, certainly, it's easier to sell yourself as a free speaker than it is to ask for a speaking fee. Today, I can ask for a quite sizable speaking fee. Thank you very much. Uh, but uh, there are many times where I don't ask for a speaking fee as long as I can sell product because I know from my track record, I can sell far more product than, uh, than would justify even my, my speaking fee. I can make more money by selling sometimes from the stage. Um, now, when you get into selling from the stage, there's all sorts of connotations. There's a lot of snake oil salesmen, a lot of get rich quick schemes, there's a lot of that stuff. And I'm, I'm not going to tell people that doesn't exist because it absolutely does. I've tried yeah. to avoid it for most of my career. Um, but uh, I will tell you that if you're just, just, just starting out, what I did that worked really well for me was I found small stages, uh, times where I could do my talk you know, 10, 20 times in a week to really perfect it, to really see what converts those sales. And then you take those same messages and I get on a you know, major, major radio or TV show at the time, take the same comments, the same messages, slightly tweaked for, for the medium I was on. And all of a sudden I could drive traffic to my website and make bigger sales. Uh, I take that same message that it works on that small stage again and again. And I go on, you know, QVC or I go on an infomercial and all of a sudden, you know, we can, we can make decent sales. And today I would also, also add Facebook ads. And, and YouTube ads to that as well. Um, so how you get onto those small stages, you might not realize it, but um, work is really boring for people. Uh, you know, that is, uh, that is a, a true statement. And there are a lot of offices that have regular meetings and they will have speakers come in. Nine times out of 10, this is local phone company, like, you know, like T-Mobile or Bell in Canada, something like that, that is coming in talking about a new product or service or something they're trying to sell to people. Um, but uh, you can actually say, hey, you know, at this next office meeting, how, how about I, you know, speak to, to the troops, motivate them. I'm, I'm learning how to be a speaker. I'm getting better at it. Um, you know, let me come in. And, uh, and by the way, you know, I'm not charging anything, but I do have books for sale afterwards. And, and in my case, it's an audio book. So my price point was uh, over a hundred bucks. So if I just sold like, you know, 10 of them, I made, you know, $1,300 that day. Uh, and, and some of these office managers were really, really amazed. I could walk into an office with nothing nothing but words and come out with, you know, $1,400 in sales. And they said, well, they had no idea that, uh, that, that there was this, there was this demand, there was this market. So um, for me personally, I found going after uh, real estate insurance companies, financial services and auto dealerships were the easiest because they had regular sales meetings and there was somebody in charge of booking those meetings. Yeah. Um, but I've done even like lawyers offices and things like that. Anything that had over 20, 30 people at the time. So I did that for, uh, for a few years, like four or five years, uh, did really well. And I was just in my twenties and making, you know, really good money and spending it as fast as I made it. I didn't have a very long, long-term view at the time. Um, but then, uh, you know, then the next stage was to do some publicity. And I would say today, if, if I was born today and just starting over, it would be the next stage would be to go to social media with, with the content and, mm -hmm. and, and push that. And I don't even think I, I have my, uh, we do social media for a living and I still think there's so much more I could be doing with that, but I'm only one person and we focus on, you know, what brings in the bucks. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's the main thing. And, and fundamentally, what you have to do, have to realize is everything is an exchange and you're not selling something to somebody. You're just finding out what they want and giving it to them. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't convince somebody to get something that they don't need. Uh, a lot of people think that sales is like that, that you, you know, the salesperson could be some genius or con man or whatever. And, and uh, depending on how you feel about salespeople and, and convince somebody to buy something they don't, that they don't need, but that just doesn't exist. Now you can buy somebody, you can uh, sell something to somebody that they don't need, uh, but it, it, it can be something they think they need or it's yeah. something they believe they need, but you can't sell something to somebody that is not something that they don't think that they already need. You can't hypnotize somebody. That's not the way it goes. So when you realize that, and this is the advice I give to a lot of my, uh, a lot of my clients is, uh, you want to go into a room already offering something that they've already been salivating for and don't know it. So yeah. you want something that they already need. They already worry about. Like I said, I went after, you know, students for a while, but it was a fickle market because they were like, Hey, I already know everything because I'm a kid and all that. Um, but uh, you know, you take somebody who's like, you know, 45 years old and they're like, wow, you're in the Guinness book of records for memory. I need to improve my memory. Yeah. Boom. There's, there's no discussion about whether they need the product. And that is the secret. If you're having a discussion about whether somebody needs the product, then uh, it's an uphill battle. And I'm not 
saying that it can't be successful. I mean, certainly in our, in our marketing business, we have discussions like that about what, you know, marketing product people need, but overall, you know, you're offering something that people already come to the table looking for. You don't have to convince them to get it. You just have to convince them that you're the best source for it. And that's a much easier conversation. So those are kind of some of my big, um, you know, guiding principles that, that, that got me there. That makes sense. And I appreciate you sharing that with me, kind of overarching. And, and so kind of like, you know, diving down a little bit further into that kind of conf- uh, conversation, if you will, you know, when you were saying like, you know, you're, you're able to go in there, find the need, fill the need, basically. But where I'm really kind of interested is like how you were able to kind of realize like developing those sales skills. Was it just basically, you know, you had the closing kind of mentality mindset or was it just really as simple as that? Just here, this is what I know. This is what you need. And here's, here's, Oh no, there, there's a lot more to the art of sales. And I, I thank you for letting me do a, a brain dump here. Um, but uh, I, I actually went back to the old time um, self-help stuff, you know, okay. uh, everything. I actually am very lucky to have shared the stage with Zig Ziglar, a great uh, speaker before wow. he passed away. And, yeah. and uh, he's one of those old time, uh, you know, sales trainers yeah. uh, and Bob Proctor's in the same category. And uh, you know, um, uh, all, all these, all these different people that, that, that are involved, uh, that are involved with it. Um, I, I would, I would say that, uh, you know, learn as much as you can about the sales process. It does have steps to it. You know, there's, there's that opening, there's the hook, there's, uh, handling objections, there's, you know, discovering the customer's need, uh, there's closing the sale and there's also sticking the sale. So people don't have buyer's remorse and things like that. Mm-hmm. There are definitely things that you need to do. And, and this is not, uh, once again, this is not how to manipulate people. If you go in with that attitude, you're not going to be really successful. Uh, fact is, uh, when people are buying something, they have expectations. If anything, the customer is pushing this process. They, they, uh, you know, want to see a proposal in some cases, or they want to see specs on the product that you're looking at, you know? So the fact that you have that as part of your sales process, that's not manipulating them. That's usually the customer demanding it. If you don't do it, they're your customer, your, your competitors are going to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I, I would also say that you have to fail a lot. Uh, you have to try a whole lot of sales pitches and a whole lot of presentations and, and fall on your face, uh, fall on your face a whole lot uh, to, to get it right. That's why I really suggest people start small, um, you know, with free talks where, you know, you, there's not a lot of writing on it and everything. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I mean, I remember even my first uh, paid uh, a professional keynote talk. I made $800 and I thought I was on top of the world. I had no idea that, that speakers made like $20,000. I had no, no clue. Um, and he was actually really upset because I didn't have enough material. I, I did about like a half an hour worth of stuff. And the reason I did that is because I, I undervalued myself. I didn't think that if I, if I talked for a whole hour, I thought I would bore people, you know, um, because, you know, I've been trying different speeches out on different people and everything. And they were friends and family. They'd heard all this stuff before. So they were getting bored. So I was like, just reacting to that. But, uh, you know, you have to take it in stride. I, you know, I got my check, I got paid and, and I felt great that day. Uh, and you got to take the win and, and you're never going to have this perfect situation where everyone just gives you accolades from the beginning. You know, if anything, if you're not, if you're not making mistakes, if you're not getting some negative feedback, then you're not really growing and you've got to grow or, or you're going to, you're going to be passed by by somebody else. And that makes sense. And I appreciate kind of sharing that information because it's like, you know, I realize that all the time because it's some people think that they just have that natural skill. But in reality, like you mentioned, you know, you went back to really study that information, that sales technique. So then obviously you're developing and and creating that, uh, increasing your skills and that skill set. So now coming from, you know, owner of a, a nanotech technology company to now all of a sudden into PR. Did you ever see yourself kind of going into this or was that just like you said, you know, find the need, fill the need. And I was there and just kind of took that uh, stride. Yeah. Well, I'm a big believer that um, you don't need other people's permission to, to do something. And this is kind of, um, I talk a lot about like the entrepreneurial mindset versus the for lack of a better word, academic mindset. Although academia is changing quite a bit and becoming more entrepreneurial now that you know the internet's here and, and things changing and being disrupted so much. But you know, the, the, traditionally, you know, there's the academic pathway. You you, you take your your credits, you get your certificate, then you go into the into the industry and you get hired, and then you work up the ladder in that corporation, and you know, and so on and so forth. Um, 
the problem with that is that so many industries are being disrupted. It's almost impossible for you to stay with one company for very long. Uh, I'm very thankful that my employees have been with me almost since the beginning. So, you know, nearly a decade now, and that's very, very rare and unheard of. And I, I, I take pride in that. Um, but it's, it's, it's very rare. Uh, it's also very rare that people do any one thing. You talk about doing all these side gigs and everything. So the, the whole idea of, I go to school, I learn everything I need to know, then I get out and I, I go into the workforce. That, that, that dream has been dead for a long time. It's really mm -hmm. just guidance counselors and others that haven't gotten the memo. Um, even back, I think the biggest thing was in 2008 uh, when the economy uh, downsized. Uh, so many uh, students, now millennials, kind of defining, defining a moment in a millennial's life. Um, so many students at that time, they found all of these skills, all of these things they did, they put in so much effort, were really useless. Uh, there, there's, so many, there, there's so many credits that you know, people were just not hiring for. And I remember even when I was in high school, you know, telling people uh, how many people in this class alone are going to get a history degree and how many of you guys are actually going to get it. And then how many jobs are there for people with a history degree? You know, they go, well, I can always teach. I'm going, yeah, well, that's, that's one job, you know, and what else is there? So um, I've always been a big believer of the entrepreneurial path uh, and, and simply put, when you only have to prove your ability. You don't have to have a third party give you give you credentialism, um, yeah. and 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 some people may may fight me on that. Say, well, you know, you can't get into you know some of the sciences without degrees. Well, I, I worked in nanotech, like you said, for four years, and um, nanotech was such an emerging um, uh, emerging uh, uh, industry at the time. There was no degrees for it, but I'm a speed reader and and a great memory, so I sped read through about 1,600 uh, patent documents to become an expert, uh, almost within a month, actually, to be wow. honest with you. I'm, I'm crazy like that. Uh, but then I was invited to speak on stages. I spoke at, at nanotechnology conferences, uh, spoke to the, the president's National Action Committee on Nanotech, which was under President Bush at the time, for example, and things like that. And then I, I founded a company and, and we uh, pursued some IP in the area of uh, medical device design. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing is we, we didn't get the intellectual property, but I learned a lot in the process. And I actually worked in medical device design for a number of years, actually, for a few other companies. And once again, I don't have have a degree. I don't have formal education in it, but you might wonder, well, how the heck could I do it? It's because I could open up a 3D modeler and I could design something in minutes that would take a lot of college grads hours to do. I simply was better at the job than the education system could. So that, that was something that I could do because I learned how to learn. I mastered the art of learning and I just am a voracious learner. Now uh, that skill has, has served me really well. I have a, I have a tech startup called Ferrobot that we're going to be launching this year. And uh, yeah, and, and I, 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 I think I showed you some pictures about it, but we're not quite ready to launch just yet. Uh, but essentially it's going to be a low cost animatronic mannequin. Uh, so think of every place you see a mannequin, I can make them dance now and uh, make it uh, one low monthly fee for the business owner to have it as a subscription model. Uh, so pretty much everyone's going to want one. We already have people that are, are asking to pre-order before the prototype's done. So that's a really good example of find a desire, find a need in the marketplace mm -hmm. and then work your butt off to try to fulfill it uh, versus, you know, the traditional model of, Oh, what am I good at? And you know, what job do I want? And things like that. You know, the fact is, there's a lot of jobs that nobody wants, but you can make a whole lot of money with it. You yeah, know, yeah. Um, I, actually, uh, the, who's the who's the guy um, with dirty jobs? Mike Rowe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, watch if you ever want to get slapped upside the head as to what the real world is like. Watch everything that he has ever said, uh, because you know he talks to students, he talks to everybody, and he he talks about how he's met these multimillionaires who uh, basically basically got a summer job working in a, a, a working as a septic uh, a drainer, you know, in a septic tank thing. And then, uh, you know, when the owner was, uh, was getting a little old and, and, and considered retiring, uh, they did a deal with the owner to buy the truck. And then they made some money and bought another truck and hired somebody. And then, and now they look at them, you know, 10 years later, they've got, you know, 300 trucks, they're covering four States and they're, they're living in a giant palatial home. But none of those people when they were in high school thought, wow, I really want to work in a septic industry. I really want to, you know, suck feces out of, out of a septic tank <laughs> for a living. Nobody, nobody thinks that, but there's yeah. money to be made in it. And in my case, um, I never intended to become a PR guy. Uh, I just did okay. PR to promote my memory program, uh, but I did it incredibly well. I did it better than, than 
nearly every of the PR gurus I've ever met. And then a lot of entrepreneurs were coming to me saying, hey, how can I do this? And the memory business was, was kind of reaching an arc because the infomercial age was kind of over and you know, we're going into the internet age and everything. And, and although we do have some online courses and I did some stuff there, I didn't really pursue that tremendously. I was looking for something new to do. And I took all of my experience getting on 2000 shows and I did that for clients and that led to Faro Communications. Um, and I'm qualified to do it because I've done it. Uh, that's the biggest qualification and that's the thing that people don't realize. Even if you're, if you're not going to go the entrepreneurial route, but you want to uh, get a better job, uh, the best thing you can do is whatever career you want to have, start a business doing that and fail. And, and try again and fail and put that on your resume, you'll get hired in a heartbeat yep. because that is 10 times better than every other graduate who's going into that industry. Um, yeah, I mean, when I, when I hired somebody, I hired somebody uh, on my team who's, who's, she's fantastic. She's been working on my team for years now. And the main thing that made that decision for me was that she had a, um, I won't say her name to, to embarrass her, but she had a, a team that she was on and uh, they were doing like a fundraiser and she called the media and coordinated some media attention for her fundraiser, got some local camera crews to her school. And I had wow. not met another student that had ever done that. I'm like, okay, you actually called the media yourself. That's what you're going to do here for a living is contact the media. So you're hired, right? And, and, and what was on her resume really uh, didn't matter as much as what she'd actually accomplished. And that, that's, that's the entrepreneurial approach. You don't wait for permission. You just do it. Uh, if somebody's going to pay you to do something, then you're qualified because people are handing over their hard-earned money. That's the only qualification you really need to know whether you're qualified to do this. They're handing over their hard-earned money. They're making that decision. Uh, mm -hmm. As long as they are an informed consumer and you're not tricking them or fooling them or you know, misrepresenting themselves, yourself or anything as long as it's a you know a, a virtuous transaction then yeah. you're in business and you don't need other people's permission to do it i appreciate it because i think what you were saying and, and guys that's dave farrow right there you mentioned it's, there's several things that he was mentioning there and I, that's why again i recommend just going to google because he's just done so much and it's just awesome to just and that's why i couldn't really you know explain who dave farrow is because he's just it's just incredible Thanks, what he's doing it. and uh, and this one of the things that i love like you build an incredible personal brand with your PR that it's like nanotech is nothing to do with PR or communications, but yet. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just got into it because, because this new emerging technology was really exciting and I just wanted to do it. Yeah. And I, and I jumped into it and uh, I, I, I'm a tinkerer. I did woodworking for years. I, I was a kind of a, a um, you know, a backyard inventor and, and coming up with different ideas for inventions, none of which took off or were really uh, mm -hmm. got, got past that early stage. Uh, but when nanotech came along, I was like, okay, this is the future and I want to be a part of it. And I just got so excited about it. It's, it's similar to, you know, when somebody saw the internet for the first time and they wanted to know how to, how to program a website, you just learn it. You yeah. just, you just say, Hey, I want to figure out how to do this. And you just, you know, whether it's watching a tutorial on YouTube now or, yeah. or, or going to the library and picking up textbooks and reading through everything, or in my case, patent documents were very helpful for nanotech because everything was so new. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can learn everything by, by just being a voracious learner. And you don't, um, I think so many people are in that permission mentality. Uh, it, it's kind of like my philosophy is the idea of living life consciously. There are people who uh, live life subconsciously, that is life happens to them. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I don't, I don't look down on these people or anything. I just think they're not living the full life that they could uh, because they are waiting for you know, permission. They, they, you know, their parents tell them to do something, teachers tell them to do something and they do it. And that's where a lot of that anger came actually from the millennial generation after 2008, because they followed all the rules. They did everything that everyone told them to do and failed. Mm -hmm. And it's because they didn't have anybody telling them the truth that, you know, when, wow. when, when you go into that, that, that real world, you know, that particular degree that you were passionate about, that that school kind of convinced you to pay them a lot of money to give you, maybe that school didn't have your best interests in mind. Maybe it had their best interests because it wanted as many students as possible. And they just made programs that had no financial, you know, value to them. You know, they're great programs if, if you want to be a lifelong learner and, and learn, uh, if you're like independently wealthy, but if you're, you know, trying to get paid and pay off your student debt afterwards, you have to, you know, think of that. Um, and, but that's, that's really where most people are at is, is I want somebody to tell them what to tell me what to do. 
And yeah. the fact is that doesn't exist in the world. There are going to people be people who will tell you what they want you to do, but that's in their best interest. You ultimately have to tell yourself what to do. And that's, that's just been the way I've been from the beginning. It might've been, you know, jumping into all the self-help when I was a young kid. I, mm-hmm. I, I struggled with chronic pain. I, I was hospitalized for a long time. I had a lot of ailments from birth. So I kind of went into self-help because I was in so much pain when I was a kid and I wanted to overcome it and get healthy. And that, that kind of drives a lot of people, as you know, into the self-help world. Um, and I got in, you know, Tony Robbins and everything, all the, all the, the cheesy stuff and then all the real stuff too. Uh, um, Wallace Waddle's book on, on uh, science of getting rich have probably uh, yeah. gone through the audio version about 400 times, you know, and think and grow rich and all the, all these seminal works, uh, NLP and everything else. Um, and, and, I think what the, what the, the main message of all of those are is is um, instead of waiting for a, an authority figure to tell you what to do with your life, a teacher, a uh, you know whatever it is, um, you know just sit down, get out a piece of paper, and write out what you want. And and you're not going to get it the first time, but yeah. but you're aiming for something, and aiming for something is a is a much better way to live, whether or not you get it. And people are so afraid of of disappointment if they don't get what they want. But what's the alternative? You're you're basically not getting anything you want, and you're you're giving people what they want. And yep. anybody who's trying to talk to you, even, even your parents, even people who love you, even close relationships, there's nothing wrong with it. But if they want you to do something, that's in their best interest, or at least in the, in the best case scenario, it's what they think your best interest is. But that's not the same thing as a goal that you make, something that you want to do. And then you just set those goals, write those goals down. People who write their goals down make something like three times more money than people who don't, regardless of education, ethnic background, you know, country, everything. You just, just decide to go in a direction and then you can always change it. D- don't, don't get so upset if it doesn't work. I've had millions of goals that, that didn't work out, but it's the fact that you're aiming for something that means everything. And it, something that you were saying there and something that I was just thinking is like, in my rant, either, <laughs> no, 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 no rant here. This yeah, and, is, and, and, I, I don't normally do this in an interview. <laughs> this is awesome because I mean, we're kind of getting, I mean, incredible yeah. information. And this is like, the core of it. Yeah. 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 And I, and I see like one of the things that I always like, now, foot stomp is like you're either learning to work or you're working to learn. And your whole philosophy really is just kind of always working to learn, constantly learning new stuff. And I think that's what I appreciate, obviously, your, your background yeah. because, I mean, how many times have we seen these people, like you mentioned, that are TED Talk experts or whatever, but they haven't been able to monetize. They haven't actually been yeah. able to do something, right? And I think In fact, the majority, actually, that's one of the interesting things is, is TED tends to skew away from financially successful people. I actually, I actually was turned down for two TEDx, TEDx events wow. because I was too financially successful. And, and the, their, oh, shame, their, right? <laughs> yeah, their reasoning is that, that, you know, they don't want it to make in, make it into a commercial thing. And I was like, well, I can agree to whatever terms, you know, I'm not going to mention my company. I yeah. just give information and everything, but it was, it was very much, they want the, the, um, you know, the, the, the academic style or the fun stuff. I mean, they got their own brand and that, that works for them, you know, but uh, you know, that's why you don't see the, you know, $20,000 keynote speakers on, on Ted all the time, oddly enough, but they're, they're doing talks elsewhere that are, that are quite supportive for them. <laughs> well, I appreciate that insight. Cause I didn't know that. So then let me ask you this, like, you know, what I find, in, in I have done a world. TEDx talk though. I have done a TEDx talk and I am up for, for potentially doing a full TED talk and everything. And when I launch this robot, I think I'll get a, a TED talk out of it as well. So there is a value to it, uh, but you got to play the game and everything. And you got to yeah. know that they're very, that they're, makes- they're kind of anti-commercial in, in, in my experience at least. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So then like kind of switching, cause I know like, you know, side hustlers, online business individuals, you know, individuals that want to build a business. It's like, I, uh, I know that they struggle with overwhelm. You know, there's just yeah. so much information. Everybody, Bob says this, Jeff says this, Susie says this, you know, which way, I mean, let me ask you this, like the skill sets, what would you say are like the skill sets that you think are the top priority? Uh, I kind of think maybe a few, but I, I'd like to hear your response. Like, what do you think are like, is this what you need to really focus on first, second? Not telling them what to do, but like, mm. obviously from your own experience. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, for me, uh, just so you know, and I'll be very you know frank about this. I, I have, there's no doubt, I have reached a great level of success just 
for the record, I'm not like a paper tiger. You could look on my balance sheet. You'd be impressed. I own six houses that I get rent from just as an investment. That's just a side gig for me. Like I've, mm -hmm. I've done it and I'm, I'm speaking from experience. So yeah. I'm not trying to aggrandize myself. If anything, I want to tell people that even with all that, I've had you know more times than you can imagine that you know I was afraid we wouldn't be, be able to make payroll you know, one week mm. and we got to really hustle. We, you know, uh, uh, revenues are down. We got to get, get it going, get it up. And it is tough to, if you think like a traditional person, it is tough to think, oh, I'm this great success. And then, oh my God, we're having a bad month and, and I'm a failure and I'm a fraud and all this other stuff. Uh, when the fact is that uh, every success is like that. Look at every major corporation. You know, I think like Sony actually, who hired me to do, do a gig back in the day, now going on 10 years ago, um, they, had, they had a time shortly after the uh, economic uh, uh, upheaval, the, 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 cr the housing crash, where their profits were down 95% percent they were in the hole you know and they had mm -hmm. three years where they were just in the negative i could survive three years in the negative so i would have been out of business but they survived and now they're doing you know they're doing some different stuff and 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 uh and and you know playstation's doing great too um but they had to restructure and everything you know even uh, even apple had its time where it was it was almost going to go out of business or considering being you know sold to someone else even uh, you know netflix offered yeah. to sell their business to blockbuster at one point uh you know like if you look back everyone's had these times where there's there's huge ups and huge downs um as a small business owner what got me through the downs is just a uh, sheer tenacity of hustling uh, I, I don't know any other way to describe it but you need to get enough money through the door to keep you alive and that money is your lifeblood. And when, uh, when, when sales are down, as they will be, you got to have something that kicks in, that gets you past the depression, the sadness, the, the shock, whatever, uh, and, and gets past any exhaustion or whatever you have. And just uh, hustle. Talk to twice as many people. Do twice as many calls. Push out more emails. Do, do, get creative and think, how can I you know, restructure this product? You know? um, and, and, and think, you know, where am I going to get my next sale? Uh, so... That's really been my focus is constantly looking at the bottom line, keeping things alive. And as a result, I've never had a business that's gone bankrupt. I've never had a business that's, uh, that's not been profitable. Um, you know, I, I certainly have had businesses that, you know, didn't make as much profit as I would like, yeah. but I've, I've never, I've never fallen, I've never fallen down like that and had to, had to, you know, restart like that. Um, and I think that's really been the, the key is, is pay attention to cash flow and, and, and have a way that you can uh, turn effort into money. That is, if, if sales are down, you can hustle, you can do something to kick it back up. Because if you're, if you're doing something like, I don't know, like an online business where you're relying on Amazon or YouTube or something, all of a sudden they change their, uh, Algorithm. their uh, algorithms or whatever, and you're out of business, right? Yep. So, so you have to have something that's in your control. And I would say that that's the most important thing. And the second thing is, is so cash flow is the most important thing. Always, always, always cash flow. Um, I don't rely on financing. I very rarely looked into financing for business. Um, that's just me. A lot of people swear by financing, financing businesses uh, to, to keep them afloat. Um, I don't rely on that. I rely on, on cash flow. Um, pay yourself with sales. You know, your, 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 your first customers are your early investors. Think of it that way to yep. me. Uh, it takes just as much effort to convince a customer to give me their money than it does an, an investor to give me their money. So yep. I want to serve customers. I'm also going to learn something from the customer too. I might screw it up in the beginning and then, you know, have to make it up to them and, and lose some of that money, but I'll be a better business as a result. I won't learn anything by getting money from an investor. Um, and then the other thing is long-term vision. So I've always had these two things where it's always cash flow how will this month do? Can we survive next month and next month, next month, always cash flow, cash flow, cash flow positive. And then the final thing is what's happening two years from now, what's in the future and kind of working our way back. What can I do now to, to tap into that? And I've always had those two views of like the long-term project, like the robotics project I've been yeah. working on for years, still haven't launched it. Um, but uh, you know, we've launched some other things recently, like you know, our, 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 our lead generation through social media and business to business lead generation and you know, our PR services actually doing the PR services was kind of like that too, where I was doing cash flow, cash flow, cash flow every month to keep my memory business alive. And then I started to realize that, oh, economic downturn, this is kind of slowing down. What, what can I do? Um, you know, speakers are kind of getting their, their speaking fee whittled down. What do I do? And then I, I had all this opportunity with PR. So I was like, okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll mm -hmm. do some of that and keep the money through the door. And then at a long-term view, where is this really going to head? If you don't know where your, your, your long-term 
view is, is going is going to go, then you could be kind of painting yourself into a corner. You could be doing services that are going to expire and then you'll be out of business. Uh, if you don't have a short term view, then you're going to, you know, be in the red too many months and you'll run out of run out of business. So you have to have that short term cash flow view every single month. You gotta you gotta be in the black and work your butt off if you're not. And then the long term view is okay, let's assume we survive for four or five, six years. What is it gonna look like? Do mm -hmm. I have an exit strategy? Do I have a, I'm I'm even thinking right now of a legacy strategy, you know, yeah. like like am I gonna leave this business to the employees? Am I gonna work out some sort of long term uh, board that would run this business after I pass away and things like that. So I'm always thinking long term like that, and then uh, but the most important focus is is that cash flow. Uh, you you got to get money through the door, and the best way is from customers. It's and the I think only you're, thing that, that's got me here. Yeah, yeah, and I think you're really actually a good point with the, regarding the legacy, and I think you really are very excellent at doing this. Where you are as a business owner. You have to delegate responsibilities, things that can be delegated, and you as the owner obviously has to focus on the future, where the company's mm -hmm. going, where the trajectory's going. Yeah, that's the ideas. idea. What's that strategy behind that, and how do you kind of put the right people on the bus, if you will? Well, I'd say that for the first time, I was a salesman in chief for years. Uh, and even uh, even in the in the in the memory business, I was salesman in chief. I, I was selling my memory services, et cetera. Um, and only recently have I really been able to diversify sales uh, and get other people to do some of those. And the main reason was recently that I had to as focus. in what's that? Recently, as in how? Oh, uh, like the last like two years, I've really focused on duplicating myself because okay, I was so really just the put best it in perspective. Sales. So you you were doing it yourself for how long? And well, now, now just... keep in mind, though, I'm the name on the company. So right. I'm, the, I'm the most likely person, like for the PR business, for example, I'm the most likely person to bring a, 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 a customer in the door. Yeah. Because I also, uh, uh, so I would focus on, it's not like I do a lot of day to day. It's more like I would fly to California, do a talk on stage, collect a bunch of business cards. Then we would work those cards to, to sell them on, on PR services, things like that. Yeah, and okay. so it'd be like, I was using my name and everything, yeah. but uh, it was a lot of my own personal time. And I wasn't able to do long-term stuff like content creation. Like, <laughs> like we know that we want to create, uh, you know, new courses, my new memory course kind of was put on hold for a long time. And I thought that, you know, but in that time, though, I was also perfecting the product. You know, keep in mind, I started off knowing a lot about PR, but, uh, you know, those first few customers, I was the only one who knew. And I brought on some people. They started on as, as, as unpaid interns to, to learn the ropes. And, and, you know, at least one of those people right now is the manager in my office now. Nice. So there, it took a time to teach them to do some of my jobs. And then I, so I, I, I first pulled myself away from the product itself. I created systems and I oversee it, but I have people in charge of different things. And I'm very, very much a believer in, in having generals, not minions. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just, I cannot imagine micromanaging people. Um, but as a result, you have to pull yourself away from the process. You have to realize that you're not always going to have the right answer. Um, I, I put some people in charge of the, you know, the PR uh, marketing, the social media marketing. I've got a guy who does all of our websites and things like that. And I give them a lot of creative control and I want artists who are creative and I give them a lot of creative control and nine times out of ten when we disagree I actually go with their idea there's only a few times where I lay the law down I'm going no I know better this time you just got to trust me let's do this and to, which frustrates them a lot because they, they have been given all this autom autonomy so far right. um, so so I believe in having all these generals that handle things. So the last thing that I was basically in charge of was sales and just bringing in the sales and, and doing oh, some, yeah. some coaching and consulting for clients. Um, and now I've been able to start to uh, replicate that sales game. Now, again, it's the same thing. When you hire people, you bring people on, uh, it's, um, uh, they're not going to do it as well as you will. There's going to be mistakes. So I'm using a combination of content creation, like uh, like landing pages with content on them about different products, and then uh, sales training, where I'm training commission salespeople to uh, basically we have a system, as you know, where we can get a lot of business to business leads, through social media, uh, yeah. through direct messaging and, and also through other, other marketing on social media. We're able to get a large funnel of those incoming leads. And what we're doing now basically is just filtering those leads. If there's positive interest, then they go in one direction. If there's negative interest, maybe we have a revival campaign going in another direction. If they have specific asks, we have somebody address those asks and, and educate them about our products. So that's the process of duplicating yourself. It's, so much more work than you could possibly imagine. But I'm actually foreseeing a time right now, I'd say, 
yeah, 25, 30% of our sales are coming in without me barely touching it. Nice. Uh, and that was unheard of even last year. Uh, and I think sometime next year, we're going to have, you know, 80, 90% of the sales come in without me touching it. And then I'm, I'm going to be freed up. My time will be freed up to do the technology and do other things. Uh, but it is a process. Uh, and you've got to, you've got to fail to move forward. Uh, I, I, I often think of it like, um, um, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, people who think that there is such a thing as a right and a wrong answer just amaze me. I, I can't even think in terms of, of, of right and wrong. There is no right and wrong. Like in marketing, what's right and what's wrong? There's what works and what works constantly changes. Like an old, uh, there's, wow, an old yeah. uh, there's an old native saying, you can't, you can't step in the same river twice because the, the river constantly changes, mm -hmm. you know? So it's the same sort of thing. The economy constantly changes. So um, I only think in terms of growth. Are we growing the number of leads? Are we growing the number of conversions? That's the thing. Um, that's, but there's no right and wrong. And, and, and people who are thinking, I have to do this outreach in the right way or the wrong way or avoid the wrong way. It, it's just like, you got to try a lot of things and see what works. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, you stick with what, what works and that's how you grow. And then you, you know, experiment with some things that you're not too sure about that, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, as of right now, I'm, I'm in the process of kind of duplicating myself and the benefit of being a business owner is, uh, there's a lot of people and I, I say this with a smile, but I know it's very tragic because I, uh, I had um, some very close uh, close friends of mine that had uh, a similar situation in their in their factory jobs where you're in the process of training your replacement. That means when they're fully trained, you're out of a job. Uh, but as a business owner, I'm in the process of training my replacements, but I'm not going anywhere. So that right. that means that I'll, I'll have a bit more free time, I'll have a bit more free energy to do other projects, and that's really the goal. But uh, you know, I've been doing this for many, many years, and I'm only now really getting to that point where we can uh, I can back away from that. So uh, in my experience, it takes time. Uh, don't expect it to be overnight. Don't expect to to have one. I mean, if you, if you hire us for PR and marketing, we will, we will do some kick-ass stuff and probably save you years worth of work, but don't expect uh, all of your marketing efforts to work every single time. There's going to be some tweaking. Even when we do a campaign for a client, if we don't get the results we want in one month, sometimes we'll do an extra pitch or, or tweak the, the, the pitch to, to get those results. And we're the experts and, and every once in a while, we don't get it perfect too. Yeah, and, I, and that's really what I wanted to do is just kind of share that perspective because, I mean, in today's world, it's, it's that, it's that you know, aggressive patience, like I was talking earlier on. It's that, you know, yeah. just being aggressive, worth your work habit, but be patient with the results. And I think that's what you're saying is like you were working like crazy, like a dog. And then just now, have you been able to kind of delegate that responsibility? And kind I wouldn't of quite say like a dog. There, there have been moments where I could sit back and like, you definitely do have uh, in the upsides, you do have the oh, lifestyle, I believe it. Yeah, yeah. you know, like I, I've, I've done a number of trips to Thailand recently to do talks and things like that. And that's been wonderful. And my business was still here when I got back. I didn't, you know, it didn't, it didn't go belly up just because I left it for like three weeks and stuff. Um, so the, the lifestyle definitely is there, I guess, uh, you know, all those lifestyles, the rich and famous, that's definitely there um, at all stages. I had that even in my twenties mm -hmm. at different points, but there's also the lifestyle of, you know, the way you see Elon Musk putting in a hundred hours a week uh, of work and everything. There's that lifestyle where you really got to commit and yeah. the world's going to kind of test you to see if you really, you know, if you really, really mean to do this, is this really what you want to do? Um, or uh, are you just playing around? Cause if you're just playing around, you're, you're, you're not going to put in the effort and the commitment to do it, but it's all on you. Uh, it, it's very rarely an outside thing. It's, it's a lot of, it is on you. If you step up and do the work, then you'll get the result. But it, I, I just wanted to prepare people that it's right. usually more effort and more time and more tweaking and more mistakes than you probably think. If, it, if your, thing, your first thing doesn't work out right, then just have the mindset that you're growing because you learned something. Mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to is it's that mindset. And I want to kind of share a quote that you, uh, you're, you're, you're known for. It's not rote memory and repetition. It's about learning how the brain works and using that knowledge efficiently to learn better. And I think that was very applicable because that's how you learn and how you really kind of have that hyper focus awareness to really get something, you know, obtainable. And I think that's really cool because you have a, I mean, you know, diagnosed, right. Quote unquote, ADHD dyslexia. Mm -hmm. You know, I just love to hear kind of that, that a little bit of, well, I'm that. actually, I'm actually writing a book now that I think will be a big oh, cool. hit awesome. um, on, uh, on ADD and how there are some advantages to it if you use it in the right way. And this is not just my, my idea. There's actually a number, there's a number of people who are celebrities of ADD. There's a number like Richard Branson is diagnosed with ADD, for example, too. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's some advantages to it. Uh, for example, people with ADD um, 
generally speaking, actually make more money than people without. And it might surprise a lot of people, but the know. reason for that is uh, because ADD people are more likely to become entrepreneurs. And so, you know, we, we like the lack of structure. We like to make our own environment. And we're also really good at risk taking and, and uh, handling a crisis. So when, when everybody panics, I calm down. And that's just my natural reaction. So there's some advantages. Um, but, uh, but yeah, going back to your, your comment there about the rote memory, uh, that's actually really applicable to, to a lot of areas in life. Uh, memory techniques were my first you know, dive into self-help. But um, what I would tell people is, is if you're struggling with anything right now, uh, and, and it's something that like, let's say, let's, let's just call it like some of the big ones, you know, anxiety, uh, uh, uh depression, um, you know, insomnia for some people, uh, addiction, uh, and, and any, any others that, you know, I didn't, I didn't mention that are, you know, major struggles. Like I had, you know, chronic pain and things like that. Um, there's probably a solution that will help you or at least limit your suffering and, 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 and you can adapt to if you're looking for it, if you're open to it. Um, but it is, in, it, is, it is immersed in a sea of bad advice. Uh, you're going to get advice when I talk about chronic pain with people. Yeah, you get, you get everybody and their dog who thinks they know something that doesn't mm -hmm. know anything. And, and you, know, you got to describe and talk about how, oh, no, mine, mine is kind of genetic because it's an autoimmune thing and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, every once in a while, you have one of those conversations and they're like, hey, have you heard about this doctor? They did this study and uh, you know, they had this uh, supplement and everything. And you look it up and you're like, holy crap, this thing changed my life. So that's really the way the world works. You got to dive through this sea of bad information to get what really works. And the quote that you said is, is something I really believe is so many people, if something doesn't work for them, they blame themselves. They're like, oh, woe is me. I'm, I'm terrible. I'm, I suck at this. I'm, I'm uh, oh, my, I, I suck at having a camera apparently. Um, they, uh, you know, I, I suck at writing something, for example, if they're working on their book or something. And, uh, you know, the, the, the fact is, most of the time, you just haven't figured out how something worked. Uh, the best thing that happened to me was that I decided, instead of just taking the diagnosis that other people gave me, I decided to figure out how my brain worked. And I, I would say that I don't, I, I'm not even, I don't even know it all. I don't think anybody knows, knows it all. The brain is an incredibly complex thing. But just a tiny little bit that I learned changed everything for me. And uh, I remember being a kid and, and just sitting in a chair and I imagined my alternate universe self sitting in a chair. I'm really into comic books. So I was into alternate universes way back then. Uh, and my alternate universe person sitting in a chair beside me. And I, I had a moment where I had a teacher tell me not to expect much out of life. Stop trying. Yeah. You're just going to get disappointed literally to my face. And I was 14. Um, I had a whole bunch of different setbacks. And the, the, these, the, some of the teachers, some of the teachers were really pushing uh, a doctor to prescribe me medication. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I didn't take it then because what we knew about medication was not nearly as nuanced as what we know now, but I do do medication now. So I'm not anti-meds, but in those days it was just fresh and new. And there's a lot of prescription, a lot of problems. They were, they, they were basically, in my opinion, I, I saw a lot of people medicating kids for behavior uh, in the classroom, not necessarily for their best interest. It was for the teacher's best interest with all oh, due respect. Yeah. Uh, because you know, if you have somebody bouncing off the walls and, and all ADD, you know, they can disrupt the class. But I, I didn't see um, the focus being on the performance of the child. I saw the focus being on the, the, the behavior on the classroom. So I was sitting there and I was thinking my, my, my alternate universe self sitting beside me. And I just thought, okay, what if that person just accepts everything that people are saying and moves forward with it? And I just saw them kind of age and move forward. And I just saw them kind of give up, you know? And I thought, even if I'm wrong, I don't want to be that. If I'm wrong, I want to fail doing it my way, then even succeed doing it someone else's way. And I don't want to live my whole life wondering what it would have been like to, to fight, right? And that's when I decided to start, you know, just, just fighting this with everything I could. I was like, I'm going to learn everything I can about the brain. And, and that took, it was about two years worth of work, actually, uh, when I was, uh, but you know, I was like 14 to 16, if you're keeping track. I was in the library reading book after book after book, which, by the way, um, the, one of the first books that I read was something uh, called uh, The Gift of Dyslexia, which gave me tools and strategies to help me read the other books. And then later on, I learned some more stuff about speed reading, which allowed me to read faster. And you kind of get the idea. Yeah. Uh, if you're wondering how a dyslexic person can be reading, reading tons and tons of books, well, I learned a strategy. Uh, you know, I, I, that was my first challenge to overcome is how can I learn all this information? Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, at 16, 17 years old, I was starting to do some um, cool memory tricks. Uh, and then it was going into like, 
just, I remember someone from my final year in high school and I was doing a, a, a demonstration where I was memorizing a bunch of playing cards, uh, six decks of playing cards actually for the local United Way. And I raised $6,000 actually for, wow. for them. Uh, and I was just like some kid and I raised like $6,000 and nobody, nobody expected it. And there were some teachers who still thought that there's no way I could have this memory. There's no way I could do this because I was you know, diagnosed with these things. And yeah. it took camera crews coming into the school to change their mind. Like they were so set in their ways. Gracious. We had the local news celebrities coming in, interviewing me. All of a sudden they were like, oh, wow. So I guess this memory thing is real after all, right? Um, so, so, yeah, so, so, so that's, that's the, one of the first lessons is, is when you make a major change in your life, do not expect other people to embrace it. Oftentimes they'll resist it and fight it. Uh, even the ones who, who love you dearly. I, I had, I had a family member, extended family. Um, you know, it was, it was actually a cousin, uh, who bet me real money that I would fail at my Guinness record, uh, Guinness Gracious. record attempt. And then, and then it was like 20 bucks. So I was like, okay, I'll take that bet. And then the first time I actually did fail uh, the first attempt, I, I, they basically didn't realize how much the media was going to distract me. Um, but then I, you know, when I went back to them, I heard that I told you so's from everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I talked to, to that person, um, I basically said double or nothing. Cause I'm going to go back in 30 days and knock wow. the hell out of this record. There you go. And, and you know what? And it was really weird because like after I broke the record and I was on like all these shows for like two weeks, I was I, I mean, I did like a, a Fox and friends and CNN and all these different things, all these, all these interviews. And then when everything started to die down, I went back to that person and I collected my 40 bucks. And that was the most satisfaction I had from the entire Guinness record. <laughs> that is awesome. Awesome. And see, I think yeah. that's, what, that's what I appreciate your story because it wasn't like, oh, you know, you're a doctorate and, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And you know how to memorize things. No, it was like you had or diagnosed, right? Mm -hmm. And had all these negative connotations, right? And now all of a sudden you were able to take that. And now that's your story. And that's why I, but, think but I learned from a lot of those people yeah. with doctorates. I learned from, you know, I stood yeah. on the shoulders of giants. Like I don't want to, I don't want to be the anti-school guy. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I speak at colleges and I would say that if, if I would know then what I know now, I would have, I would have, uh, you know, rocketed through academia with all the skills that I have, but I mm -hmm. learned it kind of late in life. Uh, and I still, you know, did well. I got into science and everything and, and, you know, still, still got, got some education and everything as well. But, uh, that was really my passion is, is to get this knowledge to people who are younger and younger and younger mm -hmm. so that it can change the course and quality of their life. Cause, cause you know, still that academic path is absolutely fantastic, but I, I recommend things like the hard sciences or the trades or mm -hmm. I, my, my preference is something practical. Uh, something that's going to get you paid. Uh, and then you can pursue some of the more esoteric stuff. Listen, I love philosophy. I study philosophy. I've, I've read all the greats and everything, but I'm not interested in getting a philosophy degree. And I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to try to get hired with that degree. You, right, you know right. what I mean? Like, I, yeah. I, I think that if, if you're going to pay so much for an education, really have an idea of the dollars and cents. Otherwise, you're, you're going to, you're going to have some regrets. Mm -hmm. And I don't want, I don't want people to have those regrets. Yeah. And I, I appreciate you saying that because I, I, it's, you know, respectful, obviously for that, 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 that market over there. But, you know, I think that's why people can relate to you because, you know, you obviously had that story, you kind of developed that. And I think that's, what's really cool. Now I, I want to respect your time. I appreciate you just being on. Is there anything else that you'd like to, um, um, you know, share with our audience before we let you go, man? Yeah. So um, one of the things that we're doing uh, in our company actually is a new mastermind. Uh, so we have, we have services for, for PR and marketing, uh, you know, make websites and everything. We are able to get you about uh, a 30%, uh, actually about 40% more results in PR in terms of number of bookings and quality of bookings for about 30% less cost. Wow. So if there's anybody who's an author, uh, anybody who's in business for themselves, if you get a lot of publicity, if you are in you know, CNN or Business Insider or something, that skyrockets your career. And we have a formula to, to make that happen. Um, and one of the newest things that we're doing, we're offering actually is a mastermind through my company uh, that's a you know, very low price point, just a small monthly fee and you get put into a group where, where we, uh, we really work to help propel you to that next level of success. Uh, and you can contact us at uh, farocommunications.com. Uh, there's a way to contact us. There's a way to actually uh, book a, a free consultation uh, with myself if you're uh, you know, qualified, if you have a, have a business or if you have a you know, book that you want to promote or a business that you want to start. Uh, we'll give you a 20-minute you know, uh, uh, consultation at no charge. And I'm sure you can have a, a link. We'll have some yes. uh, you know, mm -hmm. links for you to, to pass that on as well. 
Yeah, awesome. I appreciate you obviously pushing that in. Uh, right below, guys, uh, uh, in the description, you're going to actually have all those links attached to it. His podcast, his fair communications, his contact, his uh, ways to obviously just reach out to him if you have any questions. Uh, guys, you know, obviously you understand that Dave is the real deal. He's obviously went out there, produced incredible results, and he can do the same thing for you. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's social media or if it's just obviously a different avenue as well. So uh, we just really appreciate you being on and just sharing your your, uh, your wisdom with you with us, Dave. Thanks a lot. I appreciate uh, appreciate your show. This is great. Awesome. Thanks, bud. Thank you.